Ladies and gentlemen, the story that was told was true, but unable to be shared to protect the identity of all parties involved. But it was a fucking good one. You should have heard it. Facts are tracks. We're gonna break some vinyl down from the front to the back with facts on tracks. Welcome to Breaking Vinyl. I'm your host, Des, a.k.a. Johnny, 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 Johnny. Fever. As always, I'm joined by my three co-hosts. First up, the podcaster, coming through in high fidelity, Evil Ed. What's up, everybody? All right, and the podcaster, playing the deep cuts. Dangerous Dave. What's up? How you doing? And last but not least, the podcaster with a degree in rock and roll and a personality bigger than Texas. Beaconstein. Hey. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Woo. As always, the mission of this show is to introduce each other and you, the listeners, to albums and bands which you may never have heard before, while also discussing the classics. And on occasion, we will ruthlessly insult each other's musical tastes. So sit back and enjoy the show. Okay, tonight we will be discussing Synchronicity, the fifth and final studio album by The Police, produced by The Police and Hugh. Pagnum, released on June 17th, 1983 by a and Records. The album peaked at the number one spot on the Billboard 200. The band's lineup was as follows. Sting on bass and lead vocals, Andy Summers on guitar, and Stuart Copeland on drums and percussion. Uh, didn't see anything for uh, synth and keyboards and stuff, but pretty good. All right, let's do some band facts. I'll get us started off with some of my juicy, deep, deep facts. First up, the police broke up after this album. Really? You You don't say. (laughs) Number two, Sting is a cool dude with a killer name. That's a fact. Dave, what do you got? (laughs) All right. The album's title and much of the material for the songs were inspired by Arthur Kessler's book, The Roots of Coincidence, from 1972. Uh, at the 1984 Grammy Awards, the album was nominated for a total of five awards, including Album of the Year, and won three. Nice. Yeah. Uh, cool. Um, Ed, could you give us some facts on this? Yeah, and to uh, build off Dave's uh, fact about the book, uh, Roots Coincidence, uh, the book, if you don't know, it's all about theories of parapsychology and extrasensory perception, which kind of makes sense when you listen to the album. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, the album's original art uh, cover art was conceived by Jeff uh, Aroff and uh, Norman Moore. I was creating using overlayers uh, of a series of photographs with transparent horizontal lines. And there are 36 different versions mm. of pictures in uh, color combinations collect them all uh, yeah right <laughs> but the most common is what you have uh that you'll see where all the pictures of sting or him like uh reading that uh uh carl young's synchronicity book oh wow and it actually has the words from the back cover on one side of the album that's totally cool oh one other cool thing and uh this i i was kind of I think it's really cool because now I want to go check certain albums. Uh, the original vinyl release was pressed on audiophile vinyl, which appears black when you look at it. But if you hold it up to a light, it's actually purple. Kind of like my hair. <laughs> yeah, kind of like the hair does. <laughs> Dude, it was funny. So I, I, I've been wanting to like grow my regular color out. I haven't had my, my natural color since I was like, since I heard Shout at the Devil and dyed my hair black when I was like 14. <laughs> so I've noticed it is getting gray. Like when I, I'll be like, oh, if I don't dye it, I'll like see some gray. So I'm like, I'm going to just grow it out and see what it looks like. So I started growing it out and I started getting like the silver line that you don't want. I was like, oh shit. 
So I watched like some YouTube videos on how to like grow your hair in gray without looking like a fucking weirdo. So I just <laughs> bought this color, as you can see, which is like supposed to like almost dye it like this silver color. So when it grows in, you can't see it. No, it's like uh, grandma light purple. It's fucking weird. <laughs> <laughs> and now I don't know if fucked. that's actually what you put in for a search engine. <laughs> How do you grow your hair up yes, gray yes. without looking like a fucking weirdo? <laughs> yes, yes, I did, and something came up. Um, okay, uh, Fee. So first of all, I know you've read this book, so do you want to give us a uh, a summary and a uh, ninth grade English teacher review on it, or do you want to just go right to the album facts? I, I'll, I'll go to the facts. Although okay. I did, you know, I kind of went down the rabbit hole on a couple of things when I, when looking for facts on this and, and Arthur Kessel was definitely one of them. Nice. Uh, the other was, I don't know if you guys noticed throughout the album, but that, that snare hit was fucking piercing at times. So yeah. I was like, how does that happen? Why does that happen? Cause I don't notice it as much on other albums, but we'll talk about that later in the music. Oh, it's fucking awesome. <laughs> it, it is. Arthur Dad. Kessler. Um, man, this guy is a strange mofo. Uh, he grew up a communist in uh, Budapest and nice. then, you know, took off for Great Britain in like 1940, you know, when he was like 30 years old, something like that. And uh, so basically at that point, he was writing anti -prop uh, anti communist propaganda in the, you, you know, in Britain, you know, which I thought was pretty, pretty interesting. You just kind of switch sides. I don't know, but it sounded like uh, Br Great Britain was paying for him to do that. So, you know, whatever. But, um, the other weird for, uh, part about this is when he was old, he got some sort of disease or whatever, and he and his wife, Cynthia, committed suicide together on the same, you know, at the same time in 1983. So How romantic. They took some, uh, they took some pills or them. whatever together. Yeah, we, weird shit. But um, same year Hitler and Brown, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it is kind of weird that it was the same year that this album came out. So spooky. Um, ver ver very spooky. But uh Along with that, just the meaning of synchronicity itself, it, it has a lot of definitions, right? So so I guess the the thing that kind of hit me, sorry, man, I'm geeking out on Love this. It. <laughs> Love totally. it. Hey, sit up straight. Uh, Teacher talking. Love it. Oh, I know, right? <laughs> Go, Fee. Where's the rule of smack on the deck? Death. Go, Fee. Um, but the, 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 the meaning of synchronicity that I took away from this while listening to this album was, was the meaningful coincidence of two or more events where something other than probability or chances involved. So, so cool. you can kind of hear it in the lyric. You can kind of feel it with the, with the music, like really well fucking done. And I'm excited to talk about these tunes. Uh, let's do it. Uh, Feet. Can you spell synchronicity and give us the, uh, the country of origin, please? Uh, synchronicity. Sure. Uh, S Y N C H R O N I C I T Y. The country of origin. I'm going to guess. German. I don't know. Bing, that is correct. Okay. Yeah. Well, nicely, nicely done, Fee. Nicely done. Let's get Thanks. into this sucker. Um let's do some opening thoughts on this bad boy. Um, so first of all, I would like to welcome our new listeners in Belgium. And uh hugging us. Uh, <laughs> hey. please send us some chocolate i like chocolate okay um that was not meant to be insulting ah uh, so i love this song it brings me back to being a young teenager in the 80s i mean it's fucking the police it's synchronicity and i got a funny little story about this which i promised last week it's kind of stupid but i'll just let you know so it was right before junior high school. You know, you're, you're getting ready to go into big, big kid school. You got a little hair on your bush. You, you're, you're getting excited about girls. It's, it's time, right? So at the time, um, Pyromania was the big album, you know, Def Leppard, Pyromania. And I wanted this fucking Pyromania concert shirt to wear the first day of school more than anything in the world. I had to have it. Like, I had to have it. So I got my mother and a boyfriend. They're driving me Caldors, fucking just everywhere. We're looking for this shirt. You can't find one. It just, you can't find one. We go everywhere. And finally, my mother's boyfriend's like, enough. Can't find it. So he grabs the police synchronicity shirt off the fucking rack. He's like, this is what you got. This is what I can offer you. It's this or nothing. Either this or you're going to wear the little fucking goofy collar shirt. I'm like, fuck, synchronicity. It's not what I want. But I wore it to school, first day of school. And I remember teachers and kids being like, you fucking parents let you wear a concert shirt first day of school? 
a loser. So yeah. there you go. Um, so yeah, so this album, uh, the hits are next level, next level music, unbelievable, uh, master songwriting, incredible, as good as it gets. Unfortunately, the other half of the album is like very strange and artsy and it just, it didn't, it didn't land for me. It didn't land. Um, Ed, what do you got? Sorry, I went out of order. I'm going to back that up. Dave, what do you got? Hello. Um, Hello. <laughs> so, so I can't spell synchronicity without uh, using the, the autocomplete in, in Google. But <laughs> I, I, I type in S-Y-N-C-H, the police, and, and, and I get there. But, oh, shit. Um, nice. I have not heard this album before all the way through, uh, aside from the hits, of course. I remember the videos from MTV. I, I was pleasantly surprised by it. Um, mostly was was really good and a couple clunkers i thought but um yeah i i I liked it better than i thought it was gonna um so dave we have a joke in my house so i've got a smartphone like everybody else right but my wife goes you fucking made that phone stupid so (laughs) by by (laughs) by correcting my because i can't spell at all like i can't spell oh my god by correcting like i'll be typing something in like some other world because i fucking i just want to hit it and the thing will be like, so I've misspelled so many words so many times on my phone that it misspells everything now. So my wife will like take my phone and type something. And she'll be like, why does your phone think this is spelled like this? It's not how it's spelled. <laughs> so yeah, there you go. Ed, what do you got? Oh my God. Your wife is fantastic. <laughs> She's insane. <laughs> uh, you know what? This, this album and specifically Synchronicity 2, the song was my first, like, Synchronicity 2 was the first thing I heard, saw from this album. I remember exactly where I was to the point I was at a, a friend, Fee and I had a friend, Chris. I was in his basement watching, and we were, like, doing something ridiculous because I think, what, when this came out, I think it was, what, 13? <laughs> um, You know, maybe 12. 12, yeah. And... I stopped. It's this that song stopped me in my tracks and I was just like what is this? I need more of it. It blew my mind. Uh and it really changed cuz like before that it was all like Jay Giles and in in a lot of 60s and 70s stuff cuz my dad was in a band back in the day and and it was just so he brought me up on you know the Beatles, the Stones, you know, Zeppelin all that stuff. Um <clears throat> So it just, it changed my life. This, it was one of those, whoa, moments. So uh, I just, I was excited and I've never, in weirdly, as big as of a moment in my life as that was hearing the song, I never listened to the rest of the album, just the hits. Right. Because I, I think it's one of those, I don't want to wreck what I know, like don't meet your idols type thing. Right, right. However, thank Christ, I was able to, see that one reunion tour they did uh unfortunately it was at Fenway Park but still where I was the sound was fantastic and seeing them live is top three bucket list items for shows I mean it was blew my mind I'll bet I'll bet let's run it around the table synchronicity one or synchronicity i mean the song's so good he wrote it twice and put it on the same album so <laughs> which uh which do you prefer um i will go ahead and say that i think i prefer synchronicity two ed what do you like oh definitely synchronicity two over synchronicity one dave uh two definitely okay. better and fate that's a two for me okay so that's two all the way around the table fee what do you got on the album uh, surprisingly, I, I wasn't much of a fan of these guys growing up. Like I thought the hits were, you know, they were decent. Like I never changed the station when they came on or, or changed, you know, MTV when they came on, but I, I just wasn't much of a fan for some reason. Like I never geeked out on these guys until I became an adult. Right. Um, and so I was kind of looking forward to listening to the whole album cause I'd never heard it before. And, uh, I'm glad that I did, you know, it gives me a deeper insight into who these guys were. So I, I enjoyed it. I can't wait to become an adult. What's it like? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm learning every day. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's get into this bad boy. Uh, synchronicity Uno. 
I'll go first. So right off the bat, I noticed something about this band I never noticed before. Maybe not the band. Wrong to say that. About this song and at least one more song on the album. This reminded me of The Doors. It had musically, it had a very, very strong Doors vibe, specifically maybe like Riders of the Storm, but not really like a faster 80s, like more modern version. But it definitely felt like that to me. Um, bass playing off the charts. I mean, ridiculous. Sting delivers amazing lyrics, amazing vocals. I mean, it's one of the most iconic songs of all time. And and this isn't even the best version of this song. It's like the as we all just decided, like part two is better, and this is really good. Um, yeah, and like I said, it was so good. He wrote it twice, put it on the same album. So, uh, Dave, what do you got on Synchronicity One? Yeah, this has great drums. Mm. Um, he, he does some fills here that that almost sound like they're a mistake, like you're falling downstairs, but they're not. They're you know completely on purpose. Um, lyrics are very complex and over my head, but they seem good. <laughs> yeah. uh, nice driving beat. Uh, apparently, when they were recording this, um, they were set up in the studio. Uh, they put uh, Stuart Copeland in, like, sort of the big main room uh, that had, uh, they were down somewhere in the, the Caribbean. I missed in my notes uh, exactly where. Uh, Montserrat. Uh, and they had no air conditioning in the studio in in the main big room where the drums were. They only had, um, you know, like uh, shutters on the windows. And so apparently it was very hot and sweaty in there. They had uh, at, at different points, they had to, you know, tape the drumsticks into his hands and oh, wow. tape the headphones on his head because he, he was sweating his ass off when he was playing. Wow. Yeah, I mean, Sting is always like a glistening, sweaty Ultraman. So, <laughs> um, you know, I'm glad you guys are on the show because you always bring such interesting information. Like, I listen to the show, and it's like, yeah, I bring the stupid, and it's fun. But then I listen to all the shit I say, and I'm like, wow, you really got nothing to say, dude. <laughs> yeah, you hold it all together, Des. You hold it all together. Oh, glue, shit. absolutely. Um, yeah, the Dave, glue, exactly. <laughs> Dave, the drums, like you said, it's so funny. It's almost like... um. I don't want to say jazzy, but it's like he plays these really like fusion, amazing like snare beats. And Ed, uh, feet to your um observation, they keep it really crisp and like uh like almost over accented because it's so fucking good what he's doing to like make sure everybody hears every hit on the snare. Please, go oh, yeah, Ed, go ahead. Yeah, Stuart Copeland is by far my favorite drummer of all time however he is also by far the last person i want to meet because i don't want to wreck my idea of Stuart copeland i follow him on social media he posts so many great things and breaks drum parts down but i just have a feeling if i ever met him i'd be like oh shit yeah uh be let down you know huh be a let down yeah 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 uh but this uh synchronicity one it's like how do you write the same song twice and have them both be tens. <laughs> yeah, right? I mean, seriously, the opening, the sequencer part in this opening. Oh, <laughs> you total. You know what, though? I did. You, as soon as you said Doors vibe, I'm like, that's what it is. Yeah. yeah. Totally. Uh, what's his name? Uh, why can't I think of the keyboard player uh, from the Doors? Ray Jesus Manzarek. Christ. Ron Thank Ron you. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, and it, it, I totally hear that. Uh, you know, and then I love the little cymbal bells that Stuart's hitting in the background in the beginning. The ding, 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 ding. Yeah. Uh, oh, God. The melody. The flow is unreal. The way they overlap the, the vocal parts and everything. It's like, oh, fucking Christ. It, it's almost like they're like, here you go. Here's the first song off this album. We've built up and we've had this whole reggae vibe. Here's something else. And oh. Don't worry about it. This is just something we're going to throw together. You know, it's it's like a slap in the face to their genius. You know, well, I guess a slap in the face to all of us because they're genius. Yeah. Um, they just it it builds the music builds it as the simple steady drum beat and bass line through most of the song, but then by the end you're just like, what the fuck? It's so juicy. 
and just the offbeats of Stuart adds the little fills and, and change in groove that Sting does on bass. Fucking a. yeah, oh like in the God. verse, like in one of the verses where he just takes off. It's like what? Yeah, um, you know what's weird though was so when I got to the second version of it, I went wait a second because I remembered because I'd listened to the first one so you know long before. I was like wait a second, this is like one of the best songs I ever heard. I'm like. I have to go back and listen to the first one again. I'm like, cause I thought that was the best. I'm like, is it? And then I was like, Oh my God, they're really kind of different songs, but they're both so good in their own ways. I think <clears throat> what makes the second one so much better for me is that it hits right away with that verse. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know? Yeah. So Pete, what do you got? Yeah, this is where, you know, when I listened for the final time and had to take my note, you know, is when I take my notes on this, this is where I really did the deep dive into synchronicity, the word and the meaning and stuff itself. Because my first, you know, couple of listens, I'm like, I don't get it. You know, I'm just a music fan. I don't get it. This doesn't work for me, you know? Right. So the more, you know, so after kind of reading about it and then kind of following along with the lyric, I was like, oh, I totally fucking get it now. These guys are just, they're academics. They're smart, man. They're, oh, yeah. they're, they're fucking smarter yeah. than the rest of us, you know? And, uh, I, I mean, still, the song was just okay for me because I know there's like monster hits coming down the line. And and like Ed, uh, Ed said before we got on, you know, I think there's like four tens in a row on this album down yeah. down towards the, the back end. And uh, and uh, yeah, good song. Definitely fits the description of the, the album title and the word itself um, when you really listen to it. And, and I, I think this is one, if I listen to it more, I'd, I'd continue to like it more. This is a good yeah. song. Yeah, you know what, Pete? Like, <clears throat> Sting, his lyrics, right, the way he writes, it almost reminds me of, like, if a, like an English professor at Harvard was, like, trying to write lyrics for a record. And sometimes it goes over your head, or sometimes it gets a little too smart and a little dorky. But when mm -hmm. he's, like, firing and telling the right story, it's you can't get better. It's, it's as good as it gets. I think, I well, think he really nailed it where he said they're true <laughs> academics because I think, like, that's what sets – the police in Queen, apart from so many people, yeah. these guys are just uber intelligent. And it's yeah. not a music thing. It's a just in life general. They are uber intelligent humans. Yeah. You know, and right. that, you right. know I mean, and that's probably why the police in Queen are, you know, next level bands. Yeah. This album is we a have, wild side. <laughs> there's, uh, there, you know, there's one more thing with this. What you, when I was reading along with the, with the lyrics was that, sometimes I don't understand what he's saying. And I think he's saying a full sentence or a full, you know, verse. And it's one multisyllabic word that he's just stretching out. And the way he delivers it is, is amazing. You know, I'm going, man, this guy's, this is next level stuff here. This is good. So Fee, as a writer, you use these like words that just to me sound like you're just speaking in like Korean, but like, <laughs> my, my, my wife being a novelist, she does the same thing. Like we'll be on the movie podcast. She'll write out the script and I'll be reading it. And I'll be like, I'm like, what the fuck is that word? Like last week, I, I go, what the fuck is that word? She goes, and she goes, you know, monosyllabical. I go, so what the fuck does it mean? She's like, well, you know, it means to, uh, you know, to die faster or whatever. I'm like, why the fuck don't you just write to fucking die faster? She'd be like, so, so I think she does it to fuck with me. I would love to hear my wife talk to you for like 10 minutes. They'd be like, and she'd be like, -boo -boo. Be like oh, I must be there. And I'd be like, are you guys speaking English? <laughs> Holy shit. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> I'm not, I'm not bagging on you for being smart. No, <laughs> this no. is more a, a fucking, uh, uh, yeah, I'm dumb. So here we go. Honestly, what's <laughs> funny, right? Rem like, remember when you were a kid and you were, you were younger and you're like, oh, fucking nerd. You're so <laughs> smart. Now as an adult, you're like, fuck, I wish I was that guy. <laughs> oh God. Yeah. I wish I learned to do something beside paint. <laughs> I wish stayed in school. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, whenever I'm like cutting it around the little pipe that goes from the toilet into the wall, I'm like, God, I'm dumb. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, shit. Track two, uh, Walking in Your Footsteps. Oh, so, first of all, I hated the percussion track on this. It's mind-numbingly repetitive and i know he's adding a bunch of little nuances and things and like so unlike with purple rain where they would give you this one beat that would go through the whole song at least these guys like put a whole bunch of like exits on this one beat so you know it's it's very complicated but very simple at the same time which i guess is kind of genius i, can, I don't know 
uh, it just I didn't like it. And then Sting, Sting starts talking about dinosaurs, and I really didn't like that at all. Um, this lyric composition, it's not for me. And, and composition, that's about as big as I'm going to go today. Uh, with words. P. <laughs> um, I got you. <laughs> Multi-syllable words. Sometimes I'll spit out some word, right? Like, uh, I can't think of one now, and I'll be like, baby, did I use it right? She'd be like, yeah, it's close enough. Um, <laughs> there's some fun little uh, guitar parts going on here, too, but overall... Not a fan of this track. It's everything I don't like. It's too smart. Dave, what do you got? Uh, was this on the Lion King soundtrack? Oh, fuck it. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? It's it's a little too weird, you know, world music kind of out there for me. Um, but yeah, Andy Summers had it easy that day when they were recording it. You know, it's just some uh, random scratching, a little volume swell here and there. Yeah. You know, make make a little, a little spicy noise. But uh, it, yeah, I wasn't really into that one. No, it sucked. Ed, you got it. Tell us why we yeah. love this song. No, no, you know what? I, I I agree with Dave. It's got that world music sound, and that's why, like, the first note I wrote here is this song has a massive Paul Simon vibe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, this only is totally... Without the hook. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. Although, you know, the rhythmic patterns of the sequencer or whatever that thing is that they're using to make, like, the basically hold the rhythm of the song, it... it it, it was it was enjoyable, I thought. Uh, you know, then add the lyrics and melody. I have to think there's something connected with the whole Paul Simon thing. You're like, like almost like they're like, hey, let's write a Paul Simon tune, you know, yeah. and then it just didn't go anywhere. Uh, but really, this track, I enjoyed it if I'm in the correct mood. Like the first two times I heard it, when I'm listening through, I'm like, oh, this is total garbage. I just don't get it. And then all of a sudden I listen to it again and I'm like, oh, wait, no, this I, I get it. I see it. Like it clicked, but not, it's not a great song, but I get what they were trying to go for. Uh, overall, the song is very uneventful, but it, I think it has a great flow to it. Dude, it's like the museum. Why has he got those funny little front legs? Like, come on. I don't, if you're not from Boston, you've never seen the commercial for the Museum of Science. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> with T-Rex with the tiny yeah. legs. Why do you get that little front legs? I like, I like turtles. Okay, so fucking, go ahead. Well, I think like you know, I kind of bounce between like childhood and adulthood in this album a lot, and you know, like when we were kids, you know, like teenagers going into early twenties, it's like, yeah, man, let's get high and go to the Pink Floyd Laser Light Show, you know? Sure. And then I'm sitting here like as an adult going, listening to this song, going, I bet if I took an edible and had like a really good conversation with someone, this album would be fucking intense. You know, like this would be a really good experience nice. for me. Song's just okay. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think I need an ed edible to make it like better than okay. And so Fee, yeah, do you just... eat edibles? Occasionally. Yeah. Do you smoke mm -hmm. pot? No. Okay. I don't smoke Good. anything. I mean, you don't have to, you don't have to divulge that information. So for the listeners, <clears throat> I feel like I do share a lot of my personal life and guys probably think it's different than it is. So you all know, I have been sober as a judge, no booze, no drugs, no nothing. I also don't eat pork or red meat for 10 plus years now, which is really amazing. All so, right. Yeah. All right. There you go. Which is uh, amazing because I think you did enough earlier <laughs> that you just have this lunatic personality because, oh my God, do I enjoy golfing with you? Oh shit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was never like, you know, I was never like fall down drunk or anything like that. There was no AA or anything. Just one day I just decided that, you know, it was time to fucking just, you know, change the way I live my life. And I did. And, you know, things are things are good. Okay. Um, oh my God. Track three. Uh, we get the dreaded fade in here. Uh, so I don't like songs that fade in for the most part, but it's okay here. And immediately the brass catches my ear. I really like the horns in the beginning. Uh, drums, absolutely incredible. Again, that, that really fucking slick drum snare sound. And when I say slick, it's like in an opposite way. It's not slick. It's fucking just like in your face and crisp. Um, Sting gives me some good lyrics and decent vocals, but the song lacks any hook at all. Any hook. He rehashes one line in this. I don't know if you guys caught it. 
a thousand rainy days since we first met. I don't know. Why did he use it in this song? It's weird. I mean, it seems like the kind of guy that's not running out of lyrics and doesn't have to grab from like a big song like that, but I, it popped right out to me. Um, and I was on the fence with the ending of this song that like the way it, you know, devolves and just kind of, yeah, just, <laughs> I'm with you, Fee, just kind of turns in and it's, it's, it doesn't get sloppy. It doesn't. And it's, and it's takes amazing musicians to devolve like that and still have it be perfect musicianship, which it is, but I didn't like it. And overall, I didn't care for the song. Um, Dave, what do you got? Well, I kind of got a vibe of, uh, you know, owner of a lonely heart from the beginning of this song. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I believe his snare is, is, has that sound because from what I was reading, they cranked it up as tight as it would go. You know, they just cranked it all the way up to, to get that snap. Hmm. Um, it's a more straight ahead song, which I liked. Uh, nice drum and bass, uh, great at- atmospheric guitar. Uh, maybe the highest note I've ever heard Sting sing in yeah. there. Um, I like the sax solo at the end. I would have cut about 20 seconds off where it just got too weird. It just yeah. got too out there. I, I would have cut that part. Um, but yeah, it just got a little too nuts there. It was a little, it was a little unhinged at the end. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's again, they were going for like these, these little sections of like, you know, uh, you know, like jazz stuff and, you know, just, I, I get what they're going for. They were trying to show, you know, we can do it all. Ed, sure. you got- yeah. See, I liked the fade in opening in this case. I thought it worked for the song. It did. Uh, you know, it, but this, I think, I think the song is, this is about as close to the reggae vibe that, the police was famous for um on this album in my opinion but it also and i couldn't unhear it once i heard it there is one line that is totally uh paul mccartney baseline where i'm like oh wait this is from x song and i couldn't remember the song i'm like dun, dun. i'm like Fuck it. it's like i have well, this problem where if i hear a song i can't think of another song right but it, it you hear it and once you hear it if you're listening to the bass line you're just like oh yep there it is um what was i the really song? like andy summer's guitar in it. what's that what was the song did you ever figure it out no okay i didn't have time i was like just like i said earlier i was masturbating to this whole fucking album <laughs> i mean <laughs> i've been wearing my uh virtual helmet a lot this week <laughs> <laughs> Oh, but I, I, Andy Summers' guitar, I think, is really flavorful and fills the song really well. Uh, you know, then the breakdown in the song happens at the end of the song, and it, it just, as much as I like the deconstructed ending with the drums to just a saxophone, I wish it wasn't a saxophone. I wish it was Andy Summers playing guitar mm-hmm. at the end, uh, and it just kind of faded out to whatever the fuck he wanted to play, mm-hmm. because I think he is a very underrated guitar player, you know, and I get it. You know, it's kind of like Alex Lifeson in, in, in rush. When you have a rhythm section like that with a monster drummer, a monster bass player, singer, you're just kind of lost, but you're a great musician. So I really wish they took the opportunity. Don't play the sax. Let Andy play the guitar out. It would have been better. I don't know that that comparison doesn't really work for me. I mean, rush. Yeah. The bass is, it's a base, uh, it's a base based, not to use base twice like that. Fee's like, no, you can't do that. That's bad. No, English. no, guess what, Des? They're spelled differently. <laughs> and bass. So bass, bass, and bass. There are three different spellings of bass. No. No. <laughs> Fee is like two different. Okay. Okay. Um, no, but like with, with um, Rush. Okay. Yeah. So it's all built around the bass. He's, Kenny Lee's amazing. But the guitar player is also amazing, and they let him loose Absolutely. all over those Rush albums. Yeah, with the solos, yeah. But I think, like, I think he's just like when people hear Rush, they think of Neil Peart and in Getty. Of course, Lee. of course, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Way before Alex Life. Yeah, but they, you don't hear you don't hear this guy playing. You know, no, leads but that's like that. I, think, I think Andy Summers is super underrated. Because it's always Sting in Stuart Copeland. See, I'm not sure if he's underrated because I've never heard him play a guitar <laughs> riff that I couldn't play with fucking like a left-handed guitar, like switching hands. He's not uh, playing. He's not playing uh, 
super tasty licks where I'm like, wow. Uh, uh, maybe, I, th- I think I think you need to rhythm. I think no, there's rhythmly, more to rhythmly, it. rhythmly, I have, but they, you don't hear him playing a lot of leads on. Oh yeah, no, no, I act, absolutely, I agree. Yeah, yeah so yeah. that's what I'm saying. I I, maybe that, yeah. he is, maybe yep. underrated. I just didn't, yeah. you've never let me hear it, so I don't know. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> yeah. uh, Fee, what do you got? So you guys are telling me that garbage at the end was done intentionally. Oh yeah, yeah, really, yeah, yeah. Oh wow, <laughs> wow. I, and not I would easy not, to execute properly either. Yeah. Yeah. That's and, and not a mess. Think, that's that's a that's a, a genre of music that some people listen to and go, holy shit, that's amazing. Yeah. Really? Wow. All right. My like robot fucking linear brain doesn't think that way. So yeah. Um I you know, if, if it weren't for that part, I would have really liked this song a lot. I, I thought it was definitely like good to listen to, you know, and then the end happens and left turn it was it was gone for me but but it was an okay song like it was definitely one of my higher rated songs that weren't one of the monster radio hits from back in the day yeah so let me tell you why the end is so great if you take a drummer that is just a remedial rock drummer and you say Mm -hmm. we're gonna take the drum track off of the ending this and you're gonna play the drums to the ending of this song you can't do it they can't do it they can't they can't catch the timing they can't keep they, they just wouldn't know what to do so mm-hmm. that's what makes it so impressive is that the guy is playing it's next level drumming. I mean, it's not for me, but it's also not for 70% of the rock drummers that we all know. So sure. There you go. Why was it? It wasn't necessarily about the, that part as much as it was about the saxophone. I believe, you know, that really kind of, you, you know, it felt like they gave someone a saxophone, like Dave mentioned last week, like they gave someone a guitar for two weeks and said, you're doing this part, you know, right. it kind of right. felt that way to me with the saxophone at the end. And it kind of, it kind of wrecked the song for me. It went from a potential playlist song to just, okay. Yeah. In that style of music though, that's what you do. You make it sound diminished. You make it sound deconstructed. I mean, if it was sexy sax, it wasn't going to work. So this is not the Lost Boys saxophone. This is not a greased up man with a mullet and purple leather pants. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. All right. Uh, Mother, track four. You know, let's not do this again. Let's not pick another album that, that doesn't cause us to just fucking scream at each other. <laughs> um, uh, you got to throw these in every now and then. Oh, God. Unicorns and rainbows and kumbaya. Okay. <laughs> Um, so track four mother, this song has a cool story that definitely hit a nerve with me as I'm sure I have mommy issues stemming from a horrific childhood <laughs> that, that, that just doesn't allow me to have like a, uh, all right, we're not going to go there. Um, let's, <laughs> yes. I'm going to introduce this and then yank it right out because we'll skip yeah, over the, Yeah. All right, it's not therapy time. I, there's other times for that. Oh, I, but I would Sting, like to sit in on one of your therapy sessions, though. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure my therapist would probably take the day off and allow that. But Sting <laughs> just ranting over like Middle Eastern music grinder, it was just weird. Um, it wasn't for me. Some of the guitars were okay, but you know what? This song really reminded me of the song "The End" by The Doors. This is the end. Father, oh, fuck my mother. You know, like it was, it was that, but just not as good. <laughs> like, like when the doors go artsy, it works. When the police go artsy, no, thank you. I didn't like it. Um, Dave, what do you got? Yeah, I'm not, who's singing here? Because it, uh, Andy oh, Summers is listed as the writer. It didn't sound like Sting, so I wonder if it was. Um, yeah, I think it's Andy. Andy, no, Summers singing it. Really? I. It does not sound like Sting to me. I don't know. I mean, it doesn't sound like singing to me. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty so, sure it's Andy. But yeah, it's, it's kind of I I'm not crazy about the vocal. Uh, the riff almost kind of reminds me of of Diary of a Madman by Ozzy. If if <laughs> if if you can, you know, sort of hook that together. I can. Uh, complex, weird time signature, Eastern European kind of sound. Um, I. I like the music part, um, but this guy should see a therapist. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. It doesn't work for me. Ed, what do you got? Yeah, I think we all got the same vibe from this. Uh, I, the song is super weird, but for some something about it I find hypnotic. It's 100% a therapy song for Andy Summers' mommy yeah. issues. <laughs> uh, but I do like the music in it. 
uh, it's the Middle Eastern vibe, but it's got this punk undertone that I can kind of appreciate. And who would have thought to put those two together? Uh, but it also, also like for some reason, by the end, I was like, it sounds like it belongs on the wall by Pink Floyd. Yeah. You know, yeah. with all the screaming and stuff, it's like right in that middle of the wall when he's having the breakdown. Yeah. So I was like, oh, okay. It just doesn't fit the album. It, it was like, it was almost like, all right, fine, Andy, here you go. <laughs> yeah, left field song. Yeah. yeah so uh, nowhere in my notes that I see Diary of a Madman or Punk Rock, but that's okay. We all compare <laughs> things differently. Uh, Fee, what do you got on this one? <laughs> I like. I don't know how anyone could listen to this song more than ha- a half a time. Like I listened to this song one time, and never again. And never. if I never fucking hear it again, thank you. the The yeah. world's done me a huge favor. This was fucking garbage. Yeah. But that the, the, really the only thing on the album that was, and yeah. And then I looked. I'm like, oh, Andy Summers wrote it. Yeah, he's got to go. Bye. No, yeah, there so. was other garbage on this album. That dinosaur song fucking blew. <laughs> the dinosaur is oh, this is the... way worse than that. Mm, way maybe. worse. Way maybe. worse. No, I'd rather. I, at least it's kind of edgy. You know, he's like talking about his mom. And, uh, it's, at least it got real. Yeah, the dinosaur song. Teeth. It does. Again, yeah, you're bringing to... your mommy issues into this, Des. I am. Yeah. I am. It's so bad. <laughs> Guys, it's so bad, too. It's like, it's so bad. If I wrote this song, it would be even worse. Holy <laughs> shit. Um, Jesus Christ. Okay. Uh, track number five. So this is weird for me. So uh, Miss Gradenko. Okay. So holy shit. If this song didn't remind me of a Jane's Addiction song, specifically off uh, Habitual, uh, whatever it's called, Ritual, Ritual de la Habitual album uh, with Caught Stealing and whatnot. Like, it sounds exactly like Jane's Addiction, Caught Stealing. Not that song in particular, but that album. Like, it's got little pieces of tons of different songs off that album. It leads me to believe that absolutely Perry Farrell has heard this song and was influenced by it when he was writing those songs for that album. Cause it, really really sounds like it and for those reasons i really liked it because i really like that jane's addiction album it's really good i love this song uh dave what do you got yeah that's a interesting uh i i can totally hear that when you know you say that uh this was written by uh Stuart copeland uh, i like the feel uh, i'm not quite sure what the song is about is he banging his teacher or something yeah um, a cool interesting guitar solo uh and and that the nobody but us in in here is is a great hook i like that part yeah yep. uh ed talk about it yeah i mean it's obvious that Stuart copeland wrote this song i mean if you if you listen to any of his stuff after the police like i follow him on social media and all his shit is like big huge weirdly complex stuff it's just it's that's his sound uh i just it's not very appealing to the masses. However, this song, I think it has a cool bass and drum groove. And the guitar parts, I think, fill up so nicely. Uh, all the empty space, which is, it just, it worked for me. Uh, and I think the picking on the guitar part is absolutely exhausting. Yeah. It was like nonstop, perfectly. And I'm like, wow, that's that's impressive. Uh, I do like the guitar solo in the song. I think it's like the only actual guitar solo on the album. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's, it's not ripping, but it's a solo. I'm like, Oh, okay, here it is. And it's, and I think it's what I imagine Andy Summers to be, you know, just that weird guitar parts. Uh, the more I listen to the song, the more I enjoy it. I think it just has a real cool groove to it. And the but solos. It's, it's, yeah. The solo's fine. It's fine. And I did, and it stands out because it is the only solo on the album. But I mean, this isn't like, you don't listen to it and you say, oh, we got his chance. And wow, maybe this guy's underrated. Maybe if I heard more. No, it's fine. It's not amazing. It's not like listening to Eric Clapton and you're like, oh my, like, holy shit. Like, yeah. his licks aren't that tasty. It doesn't sound ultra confident when he's playing this solo. It sounds, it sounds good. That's all I can but say. But I, I think like I think what makes Andy Summers great is the is his rhythm parts. Like they're just yes. so full yes. and complex. 
Yeah. Couldn't agree more. Uh, so yeah, it's, he is a amazing rhythm guitar player. A little of the old Mick Mars. There you go. <laughs> okay. Uh, fee. Well, listen, I didn't say fucking diary of a madman was in the last song. Fee, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I like this song. Uh, very catchy, very in- infectious hook on the, on this one for sure. Uh, do you guys think it was a little bit shorter because of the picking? Because that was just overwhelming, you know, to to maintain that kind of level. Because this was one of the shorter songs on the album. Yeah, it's only two minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, because they, you know, in the studio, hey, pause it, punch me in. You don't have to play it all the way through. You know, play it in like you know thirty second increments if you needed to. Oh, so. okay. Yeah, but, but either way, back then doing catchy. it on tape, I mean, it was always so it was yeah. a pain to do the punch on tape. Right. True, true. Yeah, I'm, and from a timing point of view, though, this album, like the timing on this album is uh, next level. Like I said, like a, a, a lesser drummer would have no chance. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Continue, Fee. No, you're, I, I really didn't have a lot more to say on that, just that it was just super catchy. I, I enjoyed listening to this one every time it came out. I'm like, oh, cool, Miss Grudenko again. You know, like it was, cool. it was good. Um, so, all right. So this is where we're about to go on a four song tear. And in a lot of albums we've done recently, you've noticed that this is about the time the album falls apart, which was interesting to me. I'm like, hmm, they went with a different formula on this. They got all the trash out of the way up front and then went for it. I wish this was a fucking a six song album. <laughs> or I wish they had written a few. Like I know Sting had fucking four more songs in them. Like, come on. So, all right. Synchronicity. Deuce. <laughs> uh, this is where the album goes crazy. Um, these right here are some of my favorite Sting vocals and lyrics. Uh, guitars, absolutely perfect. Um, and it's funny because the guitar in this one, I mean, I don't know if you want to call them leads, but the licks, this is almost the hook of the song. As good as the vocals are and the chorus are and the melodies are, this guitar playing is almost what makes the song so catchy Mm -hmm. and that is the sign of just great guitar work um and of course the drums and bass i mean it's almost not worth mentioning anymore because they're so good on every song but yeah it's fucking amazing hey what do you got cool driving beat on this uh i like the way the the guitar and the bass uh are playing in the verses with sort of single notes uh, and they join and diverge. You know, they're they're playing some of the same notes, and then they're playing sort of a harmony to each other to imply chords. If if you listen to that, it's really cool. Um, nice. The lyrics sort of give you a tour of people uh, with some problems and the the unknown horror being the the Loch Ness monster that looms on the horizon. Um, interview with Andy Andy Summers. Uh, apparently the solo was done with uh, a Fender Strat and some Marshalls. Uh, he was waiting for them to run the track and he's messing around with feedback and they basically uh, you know, stop the tape and be like, okay, cool, we got it. <laughs> and he, oh, he was shit. waiting for them to start the tape because he didn't hear anything <laughs> and he's just messing around. But yeah, he got this, you know, this awesome sort of feedback solo. You know, it's just spent Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was cool. a cool story. Cool. Um, Ed, what do you got on this one? Oh, I got War and Peace. I literally wrote a novel. Uh, you know, I already told the story and how the song just changed my life, but I was literally heartbroken when I when I realized that this was their last album. It's like, are you kidding me? This song has so much energy in it. I was in a band uh, previously, and we used to open shows with this song, and it never failed to get the band energy up and the crowd energy up where it was like, okay, first set is going to be no problem. doesn't matter what we put after the song. Everyone's energy is so high after this. And people were just like, what the fuck that it, it was, it was a never fail song. Um, I, I would literally the opening of this song might be one of the greatest openings ever written just with the, the whole feedback in the keyboard it oh god and then the the way the drums and bass kick in with that steady beat it's like then the the guitar group comes in it's just like go fuck yourself yeah it, <laughs> it, it's oh and and like dave said the way the bass and guitar work and then they separate 
it it's just the dynamic between them it oh god i just love it the lyrics for christ's sakes it's <laughs> oh i i just I was exhausted listening to this song. Like I said, I jerked off to it. It's, it's, it's turning into Fran Drescher here. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, it, it, this oh, song God, is just... Oh, let me tell you about this song. It, no, it, oh, it just it, it literally gets me aroused. It, it hits every... Sure. Whatever chemical it can release in my body, endorphins, adrenaline, depression, fucking everything. It just... It's the whole gambit for me. Okay. Fee. Please tell us why you love this song and grade uh, Ed's essay on it. <laughs> Ed, A plus, man. Well done. A plus. There um, you go. Good now, friend. I'll, I'll never play this on a road trip song with the fear of my uh, anal virginity. So, right? Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, yeah. Definitely don't let me drive. If you look over there. On. Ed's got his dick in his hand. <laughs> right, right, right. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah, definitely don't pull over for this one. Fuck. Um, no, this is a great song. I love this song. There is nothing more I can add to it than you guys haven't already shared. Uh, it's good. Lyrically, it's just just amazing. Another, you know, kind of like deep dive on this just, just got me going going down the word synchronicity and the meaning of it itself. And uh, about of existentialism, you know, on this with uh, just debating the meaning of life in general. Fucking good. Nice. Love this song. I love right, it. I need to go down the Desi road here for a minute. Go. And just go off track. Be careful. This is that song. You ever, it, you ever watch a movie and sit there and go, ah, oh, this is such an impossible situation. Like, what would I do if I was in this situation? Literally, every time I have those moments, this is the song that's playing in my head that's going to get me through to overcome whatever the impossible situation is. It's like, oh, my God, I'm facing the entire North Korean army by myself. <laughs> you know what? Let me put on Synchronicity 2. Give me a knife, all done. Oh, I will win. Shit. I don't care. <laughs> That's how much blood. adrenaline I get. <laughs> okay. So are you are you gonna uh, are you gonna rate this song twice? Is this a twenty? Oh my god! If I could. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, track seven. Every breath you take. So I'm gonna keep this simple. Obviously, like the rest of the world, I love this song. I don't need to tell you why. If you've heard the song, you know why it's great. And if you haven't heard the song, welcome to Earth. Okay. Dave, what do you got on this? Well, here's the big, big hit. Uh, in May 2019, it was recognized by BMI, the uh, performing arts organization, as the most played song in radio history. Wow. Uh, pre- wow. Yeah. Previously yeah. was uh, You've Lost That Love and Feeling. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Not, I don't love that song. <laughs> Uh, drums and bass are not as tight in the beginning as I remembered, uh, but it's it's got a nice pulse throughout the song. Uh, the you know sinister lyrics, um, Sting uh, when he was writing this was sort of uh, according to what I read was sort of thinking of a, he was going through a breakup and he was sort of thinking of a, a big brother uh, kind of surveillance and control kind of angle to you know, like a, a relationship and stuff like that. So that's where that, that sinister angle kind of comes in. Uh, but there's also a uh, sort of a songwriting credit controversy that I read about that uh, Andy Summers had has stated that this song was originally sort of, uh, you know, real simple and was sort of destined for, for the cutting room floor before Ooh. they told him, you know, do what you want on the song. You go and do your guitar part. And he comes in with that, and 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 this, you know, his riff that sort oh, of makes the song so good. Oh, and um, so there's some sort of controversy about the, uh, you know, him getting songwriting credit on that when right now it's only attributed to Sting. So he he <laughs> may be uh, pursuing some action on that. Oh, like he needs like more money <laughs> and more fucking fame and Christ. Like just fucking go with the guy, lean into it. Fucking Christ. Uh, it's funny, though. You know, this song really reminds me of, like, the the yin and the yang of the police for me. So when Sting is writing about something I can relate with, you know, he's talking about basically, like, I mean, you kind of get the feeling it's like sort of stalker shit, you know, ex-girlfriend type stuff. Not that I've ever done that, but I've been stalked. <laughs> oh, no. Of course I've been, I've been stalked by crazy strippers, you know. So let me ask you guys, let's just say... But now maybe I shouldn't tell the story. 
All right, let's say, <laughs> let's say uh, this isn't a real story. Ladies and gentlemen, the story that was told was true, but unable to be shared to protect the identity of all parties involved. But it was a fucking good one. You should have heard it. Okay. Now, again, this didn't happen. This, there's, this is totally hypothetical. Um, I really lost track of even where we are. Who's next? And what are me. we talking about? <laughs> that's, why, that's why when I get in situations like that, I fall asleep first. <laughs> Problem solved. Wisdom. There you go. There you Words go. Oh shit. Okay. Perfect. And- <laughs> All right. Every breath you take. Uh, you know what? First. <laughs> oh. Uh, Dave with the solution. Fucking kills Love me. It. So dry. Love it. So, as a matter of fact. You know what? Who who doesn't love a song that gave stalkers a ballad? Yeah, um, right. You know, it's it's so simple, but the haunting music in the amazing melody and lyrics just so good. Uh, weirdly, as many times if as everyone's heard this song, when I listen, this is the first time I probably listened to it through like high quality headphones, and I didn't realize the layers of guitar on this. Holy crap, are they fantastic? I mean. Absolutely beautiful. And then along with the piano, there's so many piano and little keyboard parts. Like I, you hear it, but I don't think for some reason it ever stuck out as much as it did when I heard it through the headphones. Right in the middle, there's a piano that hits with the snare at the same time. And I was like, oh my God, that is monstrously huge. Like it just really brings it all up front. Uh, and then the way they changed the melody at the end, it adds so much to the song with the fade out. Uh, it's just, it's perfect. Again, Ed, next level timing on this album, right? Yeah. Oh. Like crazy. Crazy. Ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, Fee, what do you got? Um, what are you drinking in that weird green glass? Oh, orange juice. Oh, okay. Is there any methamphetamine yeah. in it? <laughs> Not yet. No. Not yet? Okay. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, He's going to save that for when he goes to the sphere later. <laughs> Go ahead, Fee. Right. Um, I, I'll just read my notes on this very quickly. You know, we all love this song. It is what it is. If you don't love this song, you you should be fucking taken out back and hitting in the head with a fucking tack hammer because you're an idiot. Sure. So, right. Um, I, my note. Oh, great, the creeper song. Fuck it, I still love it. It gets the kiss pass. Okay. Like it's okay. It's okay. That's yep. awesome. Gets the kiss pass. Oh, oh my no. god. Okay, track eight, King of Pain. This is my favorite police song of all times. I mean, it just is. This song is fucking. It's incredible. This is, this is what like I always say. There's a level of songwriting you can get to, and then you just can't go any higher. You can get as good, different way, different genre, but you can't go higher. King of Pain. This is it, man. It's fucking amazing. Uh, it's so perfectly simple full of amazing vocal melodies and lyrics and one of the best choruses ever. I mean, it's fucking amazing. I love it. Uh, Dave, what do you got? Well, there's some f- sophisticated harmony in here. Oh, yeah. uh, drums come in kind of weird, like off time. Uh, I like the, the way the guitar came in. It moved the track along nicely. I really feel like this influenced the edge from U2 because mm. I got that big U2 vibe from that guitar part. Um, not sure what the lyrics mean, but they're fine. Uh, nice melodic guitar and piano solo. Um, yeah. And then an odd sort of uh, choice of breakdown after the solos. They, they're, they you know, cutting in and out, you know, in, instruments. Um, but I suppose that's attention grabbing rather than if they just ran the chorus over and over again of, you know, into a fade out. So, um, yeah, pretty good. Yeah. Uh, Dave, when they get artsy and it hits, it's what is the charm of yeah. the police and these hits. Uh, Ed, go ahead. So I wrote five points for this song, and that's all I'm going to read. This is how it starts. Then they hit you again with this piano-based xylophone opening rhythm through the first chorus, and you're just like, what the fuck? Mm. Then that snare, fucking huge to bring in the rest of the band. 
the layers of music throughout this song are so distinguishable if you have really good headphones. It was as if, uh, as if I'm listening to this song again for the first time. It overwhelms you when you're trying to break it down, all the little parts that you're hearing. And finally, it's probably as close to perfection as you can get songwriting. It is. It's, it's, it's masterwork. It's masterwork. And like you said, every single track is crystal clear and you're hearing it all at once. And it almost hurts your head because you can't pay attention to every part at the same time, but you're trying to. Yeah, it's like sensory overload. It it's, is. Wow. It absolutely is. And that xylophone comment, wow, you nailed it. Fee, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you, Des, on this. This is definitely my favorite police song of all time. I I don't know. I Every time I hear this song, I, I am like goosebumps impressed. Like it's just such a good fucking song. The build up, I love the way songs kind of slowly build up and then just mash you in the face all at once. Like, ah, oh, this song, this song is so good. Uh, this was actually the point on the album where on my final listen, where I paused it and I'm like, I'm typing in Google search, how many snare heads did Stuart Copeland break making this album? You know? <laughs> <laughs> because it was just, it was so, oh, oh, totally. oh, in your face. Uh, really, really good. Yeah, this is just, um, and I felt there was a solo in this. Did you guys not not hear the same thing as me, or is that not a solo? Was that not a talk about it? What did you hear? Oh yeah. Well, well, it just kind of like you know how you know how on like the Foo Fighters album we talked about a lot of like solo kind of over the melody. I think you got were the yes. phrases you guys used. Kind of kind of something like that. Like it was really just a mirror of, of like a reflection of that. But yeah. I thought it was really good. I thought this was the best guitar playing on the album. I agree. And being a fan of the Edge, I guess that makes sense. So yeah. Yeah, I hundred percent agree. Totally. Uh, and finally, nine. So we're about to end this lovely stretch of songs. And then, uh, so <laughs> again, this is just staying at his songwriting best. It's master songwriting. Love the drums, uh, storytelling and lyrically, just absolutely amazing. Um, yeah, I mean, as a as a species, we can all agree that this song is fucking amazing. I mean, it just is. It's fucking unbelievable. And you know what's funny about the snare drum we're talking about? So how do they make it sound so big without sounding like the snare on, you know, uh, Wild Side? Like, it's, it's yeah. not a big, booming, heavy metal snare. No, it's a tight, small, little, like, studio snare. But yet it sounds like, ugh. It's yeah. it's really it doesn't good. have that echoey reverb no. to make it sound big. It just right. sounds tight and big. Exactly, oh. exactly, exactly. Dave, go ahead. Yeah, good engineering. <laughs> good engineering. Um, so yeah, it's sort of a, a return to the reggae roots a little bit. You get a little of that vibe, uh, atmospheric, great hook, and I love the guitar echo. Um. Have, I thought it was interesting, halfway through the lyric, it turns from, I'll be wrapped around your finger, to, you'll be wrapped around my finger. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, good tune. There you go. Uh, Ed? Yeah, you know what? The, us just talking about the snare made me think of, uh, was it 3 o'clock high? Yeah. <laughs> when he just gets punched in the face, it's like, that is the snare. <laughs> Where he just hits you, and you're like, what? <laughs> Great fucking movie. Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, you know, I'm I'm mentally exhausted at this point after listening to the three previous songs. I, I'm just like the music, the melody, the lyrics of this in so many of the previous songs, they're truly just a masterclass of in songwriting. The way they build up and bring you down emotionally is so unreal. Uh, again, the layers, the music, the lyrics. It, it's as if they're playing 4D chess while the rest of us are playing checkers. I mean, just the, the, pre oh, I don't know what to say. It's like, I was literally, I, I was like, I don't even know. I don't want to write any more notes. I'm so mentally done with the roller coaster I've just been on. Hmm. Yeah, I agree. So, <clears throat> Buddy Ravel talking about three o'clock high. So, when I was in junior high, I was a bad kid, but not, not a bad kid. Like wasn't like tough or I was just a bad kid, just annoying. So eventually I got tossed out of junior high. They just like, they wouldn't have me anymore. So they sent me to what was called the alternative junior high school, the reach and the reach. Ed, you familiar with the reach? Okay. 
a it's little, a little bit, green, yeah. the little green house over there by North High. <laughs> so it was a little green house, like an actual house. And it, it housed about seven kids that went to school there. And they all looked like Buddy Ravel. Like, so this is seventh, eighth grade, but these guys were all like 25 years old, leather jackets, huge muscles, <laughs> just lifted weights all day and smoked Marlboro Reds. So they sent me to this school and I got there and they were like, fresh me. So these kids spent their <laughs> afternoons lifting weights and beating me up, basically. So eventually one day they they were playing like what you only play at the alternative junior high school, like, you know, kill each other in the backyard. But I think they called it like Red Rover or something. So <laughs> my, uh, my pants ended up splitting during this game in the back. And these fucking... These hyenas wanted to tear my pants off. So it's winter time. So uh, the, the, there was like two teachers there. And one of them was like this guy named Kaz. He was like bald and just giant muscles. And like, you know, he was able to keep these fucking savages in line. So he locks me in his office till the end of the day. So they don't, they don't strip my pants off me, you know? And so there was no bus. So he, you know, he's got like four or five of the kids in his car and me, and he's dropping us off after school. And I was living in an apartment complex at the time, Queen Anne's Gate. And he drops me off at the entranceway. And it's probably a quarter mile from the entranceway to where my apartment is. So I get out of the car and these fucking savages jump out and tear my pants off in the snow, <laughs> much to Mr. Kaz's delight. So I'm now standing there in my underwear. And he goes, see you later. He drives off and I have to run from the front gate to my house in my underpants, you know, eh. and uh, that was pretty much it. They, they decided that they needed to remove me from that school before I was, you know, killed. So fun story. Oh my God. I can see that picture it in my head. Like it was yesterday. I, no, I, I didn't even my know brother went there. I think oh, what my brother it? went there. Oh, I think, no, sir. Yeah. To yeah. the reach. I think so. With did he tear my pants off? What was his name? It's possible. I'm going to ask him today. <laughs> oh my God. Uh -oh. What was can, can you say his name on the air or no? What's his first name? His first name is Tom. Yeah, he definitely, he was, he's younger, much younger than he does. <laughs> yeah. Oh shit. So he went to the greenhouse with the fucking, yep. oh my God. Holy yep. shit. Yeah. Okay. Um. Again, I've lost my way. What were we at? Feed? Ed? Talking about fucking. Fee. Fee? Oh, it's a me? Oh, yes. Yeah. See, th this was a th this was a tough one for me because you know, like I said, I was never a big police fan when I was a when I was a kid, and I always thought the song was okay. Like I never changed it on the radio or anything. But could I really put it on a playlist? And I started kind of rating these songs overall at, on the police scale. Like we talk about the Queen scale and the this scale and the that. And I started rating it on the police scale, and I'm like, man of the last three songs, like this is my least favorite of the last three songs. So how do I go about this? And it kind of like, I was kind of spent on it at that point. Cause I knew I came, I just came off my favorite song, my ultimate high. And now I'm here at Rafter on your finger and it's a great song, but is it that great of a song? I don't know. And I really got into this deep discussion with myself and I rated it as just okay. Almost, almost playlist. Um, I just felt it kind of dragged on for me. Like, and maybe the thought just kind of dragged on in my head for a little while. I got oh my own my fucking God. head. Yeah. Got Desi, my own fucking Desi head. clearly got in your head and started to give you bad ideas. Dude, yeah. That sounds about today, right. Today, somehow yeah. today turned into like a therapy session. Like I needed to talk. <laughs> <laughs> dude, the other night I fucking went down to my wife. I'm like, I can't, I gotta talk. She's like, dude, I can't do this. She goes, can't do this. She's like, I'm not, I'm not qualified. You know, you no. <laughs> so yeah, there you go. All right. So the final song of the album, track number 10, T in the Sahara. Um, I guess I enjoyed the music track a little bit. Um, I wish Sting had gone a lot darker with the lyrics. You know what this reminded me of the music? Remember the intro to the, uh, nothing shocking album up the beach. It's almost the same. Very similar. Again, I have to wonder, you know, do, 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 do. or maybe it was, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The intro to fucking Jane's Addiction, nothing shocking. Again, I have to wonder if like Perry was influenced by certain spots on this album because it's very similar. Um, I wish the lyrics were darker. I really wish that Sting had um, experimented with a completely different melody for the vocals. I did not like the melody he chose over this music track. It really lent itself to a dark, spooky, 
uh, vocal and vocal melody. He just didn't go that route. And he never does. He's very intelligent. He doesn't really go too dark. And I also wish that at one point the music had a break that brought us into a more like dynamically quicker part and then broke us back down into the original timing and gone out that way. It felt flat as a music track to me. It never really did anything. Never went anywhere. Uh, Dave, what do you got? Uh, this was written by Sting uh, about the Paul Bowles novel, The Sheltering Sky. Mm. Uh, some cool atmospheric guitar. Uh, shame the drums and bass weren't a little bit tighter. Uh, they were good, but they weren't quite locked in with each other. Um, but there was apparently uh, Sting and Stuart Copeland hated each other. Apparently the whole band hated each other from what I was looking at. You know, they were recording their parts in separate parts of the studio. Um, oh, Jesus. At, at, at certain points, I guess, Sting and Stuart Copeland, and, and I'd heard about this over the years. You know, they'd bitch at each other constantly about, oh, you're speeding up, you're slowing down, you're, this is too fast. You know, and they could never really come together on, you know, stuff like tempos, and they would, you know, fight. They would even have physical fights with each other. And, um, you know, so... <laughs> I, I feel like uh, in some of the album that that maybe that's why there wasn't quite as much tightness that they were just, you know, oh, fuck that guy. I don't want to play along with his you know drum part or fuck that guy. <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, the song was all right. It's funny because that reminds me of a, a story. I was actually doing some kiss, you know, deep dives on YouTube the other day. I actually watched that interview we were talking about, the one where Ace is shit faced. Nice. It's such a fucking great <laughs> interview. It really is. But um, so it turns out like the last show that Peter Chris played with Kiss, it may have been the last show or at least one of the last shows. Um, he started slowing down and speeding up during the song just to fuck with them. And they finally were like, you know what? <laughs> fuck you. Yeah. You're done. Get the fuck out. But I mean, we've all played in bands together, not Fee, but the three of us. You ever played in a band where you just fucking hate everybody right before the band broke up? <laughs> Fuck you, you losers. Yeah. Oh my God, yes. <laughs> and it's always the other guys. It was never me. Oh, of course. <laughs> That's what everyone says. <laughs> okay. Um, Ed, go ahead. Yeah, so to, to uh, go off what Dave just said about the police just hating each other at this point, I forgot to bring this up uh, during every breath you take. Uh, supposedly, <laughs> Sting and Stuart Copeland got literally got into a fist fight, uh, and then because of this, uh, the attempt to live track that they were doing, the producer basically said, "Nope," I and he just cut all the pieces, including all the drum parts, like just took little samples and basically finished the song for him because he just couldn't deal with them at this point. Uh, so I was like, wow, that's that's pretty interesting. Yeah, didn't the like, producer to, to, almost quit over over that? I yes, was reading. He almost quit yeah. over that. Yes, correct. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Uh, you know, T in the Sahara. I'm kind of glad that they put the song there in in to end the album, at least with this, what we're going with, because my copy, uh, I had the murder by number as the last song, but either way. I really needed a break from the roller coaster I just went on of those four songs in a row. And I think just the chill staccato bass with the, you know, classic Stuart drum part under it and Andy laying down a nice chill guitar part blended with the keyboards. It kind of allowed me to kind of get back in the mindset after just the fucking intensity of those previous four songs. You know, it just, it, it, it almost like, like it allowed me to sit down and kind of process what I just listened to while this is playing in the background because it's totally a background track. It's it's you know that's it. It's yeah. it's just uh. um fee final song. Tell us about it. Yeah, this is just another existential crisis for Sting and the Boys here. I think uh, I, my first note was we're on the road to nowhere because this song fucking goes nowhere. You know, um, yeah, I wish it was more like the actual song. We're on the road to nowhere by the talking heads because I would have enjoyed it. I um, love the talking but, heads, but it was just OK. Like like Ed, you like you were saying that it's it's background music. You know, it's 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 not good. It's not bad. But when the song ended, I was like, oh, that's it. OK. And then move on to the next song, you know, nice, nice. just OK. Uh, 
So, um, yeah, so we finished up this album. Uh, and now it is time to release the bonus track. <laughs> This week's bonus track was requested by Peter Venkman from the Big Apple. <laughs> Peter writes, hey guys, love the show, especially Fee. Dez sucks. Oh wow. I'd love to hear you guys review Dead on Time by the Mighty Queen. All right, Peter, you keep chasing those ghosts. So I can't believe I've never heard this song before. Um, before Peter suggested it uh in my opinion this is brian may at his best i mean wow right am i right absolutely mm -hmm. uh, absolutely oh, oh whoo these guitars are fucking scorching hot um this song is fucking great the my one tiny tiny little knock and it's just tiny a little bit is i thought the chorus was a little bit repetitive but overall amazing song i can't believe i've never heard it before i'm super happy that it was requested by uh ed <laughs> and uh so overall for me this song is pushing 79.9 watts maybe a little lower but it's queen so there it is boom uh ed what do you got or uh, no dave what do you got all right this was written by brian may from the 1978 jazz album has all the great stuff we love about queen the lush guitar harmonies freddie singing his ass off sweet yes. riffs Savage drumming, even a little flanger sweep reminiscent of Keep Yourself Alive from their debut album. Uh, it's not their catchiest or poppiest song. Uh, so to me, for Queen, it's merely great instead of astounding. That's what I had. Yeah, yeah. On most other bands, this might be their best song in their catalog. But, you know, I would go 75. They, yeah. You know, no change in does. <laughs> all right, no, I. He's right though. I mean, I I went seventy. I mean, I went seventy nine point nine because it's fucking Queen, and I just can't bring myself to go lower. I can't, <laughs> can't. I won't. It's I'll like tell the, you why you gave it seventy nine point nine. Go ahead, Ed. You tell us. All right, the music on this song kicks ass. It is exactly what like like no, we remember Queen being. Yeah, you know, it's that rock band where you're just like what. Where is this music coming from? Uh, the guitar and bass playing and on that riff is just dynamite. And then with the drums and the lead guitar licks, oh, it's I I too does. When I heard it, I was just like, I feel like I was like cheated, like someone was keeping a secret from me because I yeah. love the song. Yeah. Um, and like you though, I have one knock. Like you hear, it's a dirty, dirty recording. And then you have these crystal clear queen vocal harmonies. Yes. Where I'm like, ah, oh, you, you needed to dirty them up a little. Yeah. Have the great tone and in, in notes, but you need like some almost like make it a record so it's got that hiss behind it. Because it just stuck out stuck out too much. Yeah. But holy shit. I was like, this is everything that made me fall in love with Queen. Uh the big vocals. It, it, it's just oh, it was great. And yeah. Des, I gave it an 80. There you go. So we were right on the same page. Okay. Tell me the <laughs> you know what, though? Those crystal clear vocals are what really made it feel like a Queen song. It had that oh, signature absolutely. sound. Absolutely. For coming yeah. off the jazz album, you would never know this wasn't off one of their other albums. Perfect. Fee, go ahead. I, yeah, I really like this song, and I'm surprised that you guys are going to find I rated this one higher than all of you. Uh, oh, shit. But it was just, it was, it was fucking cool. I think the thing with Queen, though, is like, there's so many hits from Queen that you kind of yeah. like, they all bleed into this like one monster queen's greatest hits album you know which i think we probably all had as kids queen's greatest hits you know mm -hmm. yeah um so so yeah so that's kind of probably why i know i i never heard this song before today but uh overall out, outside the ending was a little bit weird but so is queen so you know i'm good with that um <laughs> rating it on the, the other scale i i rated it pretty high like like 90 like if i was not if i didn't know this was queen i'd be like this is a 90 watt fucking tune, right you know right I'm like but because i know it's queen i knocked it down a couple of pegs and i gave it an 88 wow okay like so ed song. will you please calculate those watts goes and tell us what it is pushing for a watt the wattage if you will all right so dead on time by queen is pushing a massive 80.72 watts. 
I hope this comes in under um, the other Queen song because it's not as good. Uh, <laughs> Dave, will you please tell us where that lands it on the breaking vinyl wall of fame? Well, you are in luck. 80.72 okay. puts it at number two on the list, just mm-hmm. under Fat Bottom Girls at 94.95. And over Grand Funk Railroad with We're an American Band at 80.58. Just beat out Grand Funk. If I had to listen to one of these two songs, if I was forced to choose one, it would be Grand Funk for me. Really? Just because the hook is so, it's there. I mean, it's a little better of a chorus, but very good songs. Um, Can we all agree that that fucking Asia, we all overscored that? (laughs) That song sucks. (laughs) I t- yeah, completely but disagree you gotta with give you. The musicianship, I know. appropriate, still, you know, I still hate appropriate it, scores. Okay, let's uh, let's wrap this bitch up. Um, so, favorite song for me on this is "King of Pain." Song I cut definitely "Walking in Your Footsteps." The dinosaur song. Fuck that, uh, Dave. What do you got? <laughs> Uh, I guess Every Breath would be my favorite track, Every Breath You Take. Uh, it's the most accessible pop song. It's great. Uh, I would cut also Walking in Your Footsteps. It sounds like a soundtrack reject from some 90s kids cartoon movie. Okay. <laughs> Fuck that. And what do you got? Uh, my favorite song is Synchronicity 2. Mm-hmm. And the song I would cut is Mother. I don't okay. need anyone's fucking therapy. Thank you. Well... You get mine every week. <laughs> well, I got uh, enough of my own. Thanks. <laughs> Fee, what do you got? Yeah, favorite track is definitely King of Pain, and you got to cut that piece of dog shit, Mother. That thing is terrible. Okay. Um, let's do some uh, band numbers. So I've got a fun one here. I'm replacing an Andy with an Andy. So I'd remove Andy Summers and I'd replace him with Andy Taylor from Duran Duran. There you go. Nice. It's perfect. I like that. Uh, Dave, what do you got? All right. Well, we could always swap in Tracy Guns. So no, we couldn't. <laughs> Not just, this week. Just kidding. Um, uh, maybe it's his adult contemporary '90s output, but Sting really seems kind of uptight and no fun. Um, I, I would want to ditch him and uh, sub in the one man bass party, Michael Anthony of Van Halen. Ooh, interesting. <laughs> interesting. Reminds me of uh, Ed's uh, Stevie Wonder on Jane's Addiction. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Ed, go ahead. Uh, funny, Des, I had the exact same choice that you had oh, Andy you? Taylor for Andy Summers. There you go. Then it works. Then it works. Um, B, we got. Have you guys heard Andy Taylor's first solo album? Oh shit! Yes, it's really good. It's yeah. really yeah, good. It is. Yeah. yeah. Um. Anyway, I I don't want to replace anybody, but since I have to, I'll replace Andy Summers because of that piece of dog shit mother. And yeah. um, I wanted to replace him with the Edge. I thought some of his his sounds might might come in good on a couple of these tracks. Yeah, he'd work on there that. Be hundred percent. It's a great pick, and it would work perfectly. <laughs> All right, quickly, let's do our final thoughts. Um, So for me, the best parts of this album are as good as it gets. It's master songwriting. It's master musicianship. But when this album goes off the tracks and gets artsy and weird, it does not work. It does not work. Um, He's just not a dark enough individual, um, Sting, to pull it off. When a band like The Doors does it with a guy like Jim Morrison... He gets weird, he gets artsy, it works because he's a weird artsy dude and he's dark and it's just, it's fun. Uh, Police didn't pull it off, but for the five absolutely perfect 100 watt songs on this album, I have to give it a 79.9 watt score. What? Yeah. I, I have totally to. undersold that album. What? It's almost yeah. That's watts. a low score. No, that's a dude, low score. dude, it has six shitty songs on it. It has five good songs. I can't. I wanted has, to go lower. It has five eh songs. There's only one real shitty song. Oh, I forgot we didn't do the sixth song. We left right. it off. Okay, so, so I think fifty percent of this album is a hundred watts, and you're yeah, giving so it a seventy-nine. I only took twenty watts off a perfect score for five subpar songs. That's more than fair, I think. You gave Rat Out of the Cellar a 79.9. I should have given it an 89.9. I undersold the album. It's almost a perfect album. 
Ed, go ahead. Tell us what no, you got. No, Dave's next. Oh, I'm sorry. All day. But you know why? Okay. So on the screen I'm looking at, it goes me, Ed, Dave, Fee. So I keep looking at your fucking head. Dave, go ahead. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I was pleasantly surprised by this album. Like I said, uh, I wasn't sure exactly what to expect aside from the the pop hits, um, and and those pop hits are very different than the other ones at the time. You know, something like eight six seven five three zero nine or My Sharona, which are great. Oh, I love My Sharona. Great songs, um, but this is kind of a different different league, a different class of of songs. Uh, plenty of quality material here, and it's kind of musiciany. Um, you know, sort of a, a little more highbrow than than you know a lot of other pop stuff, but they sold eight million records. You you can't argue with that kind of uh, uh, success. Uh, definitely worthwhile listen. I gave it a seventy two. Seventy two. See, I had written in my thing it deserves a lower score, but I'm giving it seventy nine point nine out of respect for five perfect songs. But I can't go higher than that on an album that's only half good. Ed, go ahead. Oh, I am so disappointed in both of you. 80! Basically gave it an 80! Here, here's, here's why. What other albums have we talked about that had a perfect song on it? Never mind, five perfect songs on it. There were a few. Van Halen. Uh, perfect songs? No. Great songs, yes. they. Listen, I will not knock Van Halen, Van Halen because it's a lot of great songs. Yeah. But are there tens? Are there literally songs that we gushed over the songwriting and how amazing it was and what they delivered, how the recording was? Are there 50% of the songs not as good on this? Yes. But when you have five perfect songs, how can you have all perfect songs. So on a 10 song album, if you've got 10 songs, right. And let's say yeah. five of them are perfect tens. That's 50 points. And yep. then the other five are five. That brings me to my 80 score. 75. Which I would get if you actually <laughs> use that theory for everything else. The problem is you don't. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't. I don't. There's a little feel in there. You so just I, what make you up got? fucking numbers. Talk to me. All right. So because this had five perfect songs and then three songs that I thought were okay. One song that I thought was just garbage and another one that was just a little better than garbage. Um, the, to have the, the exhaustion from listening to the four song, four perfect tens in a row. And then to open with the 10, which I think, and you made a point on it earlier where they didn't. They they opened with a great song, great. Then they gave you kind of the garbage that wasn't total garbage. It was just like it was enough to keep you invested. And then when most albums go in the toilet, they throw four songs that just destroy you emotionally. You're exhausted. You're looking forward to that song at the end to just recover. Sure. So for that, I give this album a ninety. Five watts. No, nine. Did you add the five on it? Nice. You, you were going to say no. 90. And then nope. you said five. Okay. I, first okay. number I put in before both of you spoke was 95. Okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> B, go ahead. What do you got on this? I'm glad that we, we did this. Like I said, I never listened to this before. So it's always good to uh, check out new, you know, new stuff. And it definitely. I don't know. I got a couple books I got to read now. So, you know, it set me on a deep dive on a, on an academic level that I enjoy. So, uh, I, if I was rating it just on its music alone, I was kind of down between exactly between, uh, Des and Dave on this one. But when I, when I factor in all of the other things, I gave it an 81. I think an 81 is about where it needs to be. Great. I think that's a very good score. Ed, please calculate the scores on your little calculator you just showed us and tell us how many watts this album is pushing. <laughs> All right. So the Synchronicity album by The Police is pushing 81.97 watts. 81.97 watts. Um, Dave, please tell Which us. is embarrassing by all you motherfuckers because wait till you see where this falls. Okay. So why do you know? Do you keep score? I look at the spreadsheet. Yeah. 
Where's this spreadsheet? I, I Don't tell me, because I'll go and start changing shit. All right, Dave, Ed, go do it. Go ahead. <laughs> Dave, please tell us where this lands on the uh, breaking vinyl chart. All right. This puts it at number eight on the chart, uh, just under Princess Purple Rain and just over Motley Crue Shout at the Devil. All right. Uh, definitely uh, yeah, Purple Rain. Hold on. Guess what album is right above that? What? <laughs> what? Junkyard. Yes. Yeah, should oh. be. It's got way more in head. Fuck you. <laughs> way more. Oh. You guys should fucking hang yourselves. Oh, God. Okay. Okay. So quickly, I want to give a shout out to our listeners. Um, if you're hearing your country, more than likely, this is you. So I'm saying thank you to you. So I'm just going to run it down. Germany. Thank you. Canada. Thank you. UK. Thank you. Indonesia. Thank you. Spain. Thank you. Peru. Chile. Japan. Uh, Odegorigato? No, I don't know that. <laughs> Mr. Robot. Uh, Australia. Albania. Austria. France. Colombia. Venezuela. <clears throat> Venezuela. Venezuela? What the fuck? <laughs> Venezuela. Venezuela. <laughs> Venezuela. <laughs> oh, Venezuela? Is that right? Venezuela. Thank Christ, these people have English as a second language better than English as your first language. Ecuador, <laughs> and most recently, Belgium. Thank you so much for tuning into the show. We appreciate every single one of you, and uh, we are slowly taking over the globe, as you can see. Okay, so next week, we will be back, and we will be listening to a song picked by one Dave. Dave, please tell us what album we will be listening to this week and discussing next week. All right. My pick in honor of Halloween coming up, my favorite holiday. Mm -hmm. It's an all-time classic. Welcome to my nightmare by Alice Cooper. Hell yeah. <laughs> so good. Oh, great pick, Dave. Okay. Um, so that's it. As always, guys, without you, the show sucks ass. Uh, without the listeners, we're nothing. Thanks for tuning in. Appreciate each and every one of you. And um, tonight, we will be reviewing Mama on Hey, Did You Ever See That Movie? So if you like movie reviews, go over and take a listen. It's a lot of fun. And until next week, got one question. Oh, no, there is no question. Take the records out of the sleeve and let the music breathe. <laughs> See you later. See ya. Somehow yeah. today turned into like a therapy session. Like I needed to talk. <laughs> <laughs>